this is not just two little kids, you know, who happened to be there. They were there when the object crashed. They saw the crash. They lived through it. They went through the smoke and the fire and so on. So they, they rushed there. And what they confronted was not an, air, an airplane. Uh, it was this very large oval object. And, and then at the end of the recovery, which took nine days, uh, the, the object was packed and ready to go to be taken back to White Sands, to the atomic base. Mr. Padilla, the kid, Jose, uh, crawled inside the object, and that's when he retrieved that bracket that, uh, that we now have. I grew up in France, as you may know, uh, very interested in, uh, in astronomy. And then uh, when I was a, a, a teenager, I, I was uh, about 16, uh, one, uh, one very bright afternoon, blue sky, uh, my mother was in the yard doing some gardening and called me and I was working with my father inside the house. I came out and saw an object that was uh, essentially a, a shiny disc, very clear, um, over a church uh, that was about half a mile away from where we were. And it had a little dome on top, little transparent uh, dome. Um, and, uh, you know, I saw it for several minutes. The next day, uh, I spoke to a friend of mine from college uh, who was in a house about another half mile away from us, up, up a hill. This was just outside of Paris, about an hour drive outside of Paris. And he had seen it and he had looked at it with binoculars. And I asked him to draw it. And what he drew was exactly what I saw. So that, that we never had any explanation. We never reported it. And I always carried that interrogation, you know, in, in, inside myself. And then I sort of, you know, let it go because there were so many prototypes coming in at, at that point. You know, this was about 1955. Uh, the, the first jets were flying. There, were, there was a, a base, an air base close to where we were. We thought maybe it was, you know, some sort of prototype. And then this was reawakened when I read a book by Aimé Michel, who was uh, really the first scientific um, writer who looked for patterns in the whole thing. And by then I was working at Paris Observatory. I had access to computers and I started looking at it and the patterns were there. So that's what convinced me to go ahead and, and continue the study. Dr. Valet, you and Paula have a book coming out called Trinity. What drew you to that particular case? We came to it in two different directions. I was uh, frankly late in being taking an interest in crash cases because every time we looked, there was there was some very interesting data, some residual samples, but no obvious. It was difficult to reconstruct the whole study. The witnesses came after the actual case and so on. And I started uh, being interested through friends of mine in New Mexico, and I, I had started to go on digs in, in some areas and collecting data because now we have, in Silicon Valley, we have the instrumentation to do a much more profound assessment of those materials. So we could, we could get some, some ground truth. Um, and the, the friend I had wanted me to come to that site in 1945 uh, near San Antonio, San Antonio, New Mexico, not San Antonio in, in Texas, where something had happened. Unfortunately, he died. And uh, at around that time, uh, I discovered that Paola had done some research four years or five years before me, before anybody else. So she should talk about how she came to that case. When I was in Italy, I'd read about two little Indian, they call them Indian boys, they weren't Indian, uh, they were uh, Hispanic, who had actually seen a craft crash 
in San Antonio, New Mexico, one month after the atomic bomb. The crash site is, is about almost 20 miles away from where the bomb um, exploded. And so I was thinking in my mind, why aren't my colleagues jumping on this? Because everybody's alive. You know, we can't find witnesses who are alive anymore. And, uh, and it, it didn't happen. I was in Italy when this happened. When I moved back to the United States in 2007, um, I didn't know that in 2009, I would actually have access to one of the little boys. Now, those boys were um, six years old and nine years old. And so the six-year-old, I was able to talk to Remy Baca before he died. Uh, it was a long process. I began talking to him on the phone to get his confidence. And then, you know, I flew to Gig Harbor, Washington, where he was. And by that time, he had told me that he and the uh, nine-year-old had seen the crash, had gone up to the craft, and had, because there was a piece of it that had blown off, they could see the beings. And he gave me testimony. And thank God, because then he died and I didn't have it anymore. So then I went to the, went the you know, that week that he died, I went to the uh, nine-year-old because I was so afraid I'd never, ever get to the crash site and that I didn't want this to happen. These guys were in their 70s and 80s. So the thing is that, you know, when we're talking about this, Jacques and I, um, you have to understand that it was a collaboration between both of us that brought this story up. Because by myself, what I do, and you guys know this, is I just do interviews. That's it. I just do the interview. I get their words. That's it. That's what's in the book, those interviews. But then when Jacques got hold of me, I think it was 2017, he was interested not only in the beings and the, uh, the witnesses, he was interested in the fact that the nine-year-old had gone in and pulled a piece of metal from the inside of the craft. So he approached me on the scientific view of that. So when we were doing this pie, you know, baking a cake or whatever it is, we were baking, we're baking this cake of a, a, a book it took both of us from two different points of view to put it together. And I had just the interviews that I had from the two boys, uh, uh, but he's the one that was able to put together the story, the background and everything. Of course, he met uh, one of the, um, you know, uh, boys and he was Jose Padilla. And then just before the book came out, we found another uh, witness so it delayed the, the uh, debut of the book, but also she was very important to this case. Now, Dr. Valet, Mark and myself, we're very interested in the scientific aspect of this as well. How did you develop this over time? This uh, idea, your scientific approach, because you've kind of, uh, I would say like a bit of a lone wolf. You haven't gone with the mainstream and for that reason, You've really developed a lot of things. How did you do that, that scientific approach? So th th there are two possible approaches, and both of them have been tried. Um, one approach is that everybody has been hoping to find the definite case. You know, the case that, as Dr. Hynek said, you know, you could, you could take it and run up the steps of the Academy of Sciences, and you... <laughs> put it on the desk and you say, here, doctors, you know, you can't deny that. Well, that rarely happens in science. Usually science is done by incremental discoveries, incremental research, which is what's being funded. I mean, so if you want, if you want money from the government, that's what you need to do. You, you propose a new hypothesis about something and you, you go one more step. There are exceptions to that. One exception is, of course, the discovery of meteorites. Um, astronomers had always denied that meteorites that farmers found in their field were extraordinary, that they fell from the sky. Because, uh, you know, first it happens very fast. So you're never sure of the testimony. And also, you know, the, you look at the sky, you don't see any stones. So that's, and it took one case in the mid 
uh, 19th century, where so many meteorites fell on the same little town and, you know, destroyed the roofs and killed the dog and so on, that there was no, no way to deny that they fell. So there are some exceptional things that have turned. Well, with UFOs, it's never happened. There has never been one case that would make everybody stop and be convinced. And I think it's unlikely to happen because there are so many parameters involved. The, the other approach is to look for patterns. And, you know, I'm, I, I was trained in, in physics, but I, you know, I'm really not an astrophysicist. Uh, I haven't practiced in that field. I'm really, a, you know, a computer nerd, you know, if uh, uh, a computer guy. So I, I've worked a lot with databases. I've, liked, I've um, uh, worked assembling patterns of, of observations, uh, first at, um, with Dr. Hynek and then uh, for the content committee. And then in France, you know, I, I'm on the scientific advisory board for the French, French government program. And uh, we've assembled a number of databases there. And when you look at the patterns, which is what Amy Michel wanted to do, um, it, you, you find that it does not match any other phenomenon in science. It doesn't match you know, the periodicity of Mars. It doesn't match Venus. It doesn't match any, any obvious thing in the sky. And it doesn't match any pattern in the environment either. So when I go into a case like, um, like the San Antonio case or Jose Padilla case, since he's the main uh, witness, um, I try to understand the culture. I try to understand the context and I try to understand the geography and the history to put the, the story in perspective. I've seen too many cases where you know, uh, some some researcher decides he's going to go to, you know, Kazakhstan and investigate something for three days. You know, you can't do that. Okay, yeah, you you have to, uh, and you you saw that in in Latin America. You have to understand the culture. You have to understand the nuances before you can really study a case. So I wanted to do that in in New Mexico. I had been in New Mexico several times before. I had worked there with Dr. Hynek because we had a small observatory in New Mexico. All those things converged really to highlight the significance of the case that, that Paola had, had started to, to document. And, and her interviews, she says, I just do interviews, but her interviews are extraordinarily detailed and professional. And she knows how to stop and, and let people reflect and go back into that time, you know, relive the experience. And that was extraordinarily rich. Okay, great. Now, this question is directed to both of you. With the book coming out, are there any other aspects of it you'd like to get across to anybody that may be interested in buying it? You know, I, I want to say something about research in general. One of the reasons why Jacques and I got along so well and we could work is because we're both European. Um, you know, I, I had a vast, uh, you know, knowledge of, of history because, you know, I'm Italian and my father was the Italian consul and I lived a historical life. I mean, I, I read books. I know history, and I could have a conversation with with Jacques. Uh, Jacques read. I mean, that book has a lot of of uh, annotation, a lot of research of the atomic bomb, the 1945 Oppenheimer, the scientists, what was going on in World War II, and for me, uh, I he actually filled up the mosaic. I did the interviews, but then when I saw what was going on in New Mexico, and I understood, you know, the mind of the scientists, this is something that is indigenous, I think, more to Europe than America, because usually the UFO community here gets one slice of the mosaic, they run with it, and they never bother to look at the whole picture. 
And I don't understand how you can understand what's going on unless you put the puzzle together. I anywhere I go uh, in field research, I'm fascinated by uh, the framework. And my, I could have never done this story with just interviews in a million years. Um, Jacques once said, you gave me the, he said, I am the canvas, you gave me the co colors. And I think it's, uh, it has to be that way. So may I encourage uh, in the future, UFO researchers to collaborate instead of take ownership of the story and run with it. Because if they would collaborate, they'd find the answer a lot quicker. There are some aspects of this case. I mean, I could, you know, I, I could lecture at a school, for example, about the case without hardly mentioning the UFO, just on the historical things that, that you can learn from just the setting and the witnesses and who they are and what the interactions are. And the, you know, of, of course I, I lived, I was born in 1939. So by the time France was liberated, you know, I, I understood war. And I mean, the, the town where I was born was bombed 17 times because it controlled access to Normandy from Paris through two bridges, including a railroad bridge that the Germans wanted to use to, to move supplies and to move troops. So everybody wanted to blow up those bridges. And uh, as a result, in those days, there were you no know, laser bombs and so on. They, you know, the, much of the town was destroyed, including the house where, um, you know, where I was born. So the, I, but I didn't know much about Japan. I didn't know, they don't teach much about, uh, in France, about the war in the Pacific, which of course went on uh, to, you know, a climax after the victory in Europe, after VE Day. And the, I read the books about the UFO, you know, in New Mexico, there were a couple of mentions. There was no book about it, but it was mentioned in passing by several, several good books um, that were talking about UFO crashes in general. The one thing that they all missed was the atom bomb. I mean, they all talk about these two little, you know, two little kids uh, uh, in that field, uh, working for their father, taking care of the cattle. Uh, they are very bright. They have binoculars and they know how to use binoculars. They know how to drive a truck. Well, why? Well, because all the adults were at war. And you know the the work on the farm was delegated to the kids, and the kids had to of course they had to drive the truck to go to go to the field, and either the truck or the horses, and of course they needed to use binoculars because the properties were huge. The ranches, that particular ranch is eighty thousand acres. Okay, eighty thousand acres is a lot of territory. And you, so they, they would look at the cattle from a distance and look at the brands and to recognize the brands, they needed to use powerful binoculars. The same type of binoculars the army would be using. So this is not just two little kids, you know, who happened to be there. They were there when the object crashed. They saw the crash. They lived through it. They went through the smoke and the fire and so on because they thought it was an airplane that crashed. And they knew that when that happened, if you were the first on the scene, you had to help. You had to go there to help the, the victims or to arrange for support to come in uh, for you know the medical support or whatever. So they, they rushed there and what they confronted was not an, air, an airplane, uh, it was this very large oval object that we determined was probably weighted about four to five tons. Well, that's not a weather balloon. Uh, the Air Force, the Army Air Force in those days, this was before the Air Force existed, but the Army Air Force, of course, called it a weather balloon. And that's why they needed to bring an 18-wheeler to take it away. Um, 
So it was a very, very heavy type of weather balloon. Um, three people had the opportunity to go inside. Uh, the, Mr. Padilla's father went inside with a, a state policeman from New Mexico um, the, the day after the crash, two days after the crash. And, and then at the end of the recovery, which took nine days, uh, the, the object was packed and ready to go to be taken back to White Sands, to the atomic base. And uh, the, the truck was left alone for a while. And uh, Mr. Padilla, the kid, Jose, uh, crawled inside the object. And that's when he retrieved that bracket that, uh, that we now have, that uh, Paola has been talking about. So there was all that combination of things, but that was two days after the capitulation of Japan. What kind of signal is that for the US government? That there is this gift that's presented, you know, essentially an intact spacecraft with no visible propulsion system where we know all the details of how it got there. It hit the tower, there had been a thunderstorm. It, it hit a communication tower and then it landed, but it was under power when it plowed a, essentially a, a, a path into the landscape, made a turn under control and came to a stop. And uh, only a pan it wasn't destroyed. So it had tremendous integrity. It was very, very strong. And, you know, this needs to be put into the, the history of the time. Um, Japan had just capitulated, but, you know, the army, you know, everybody was still essentially, you know, had not, the army had not been disbanded or people had not returned to their homes. Um, the, 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 the soldiers who were sent to retrieve it, this was not a Spielberg movie with people in special suits and respiratory thing and doctors and biological warfare equipment and so on. This was just a bunch of 18 year olds or 19 year olds who were mostly interested in doing what they had to do and then going and having ice cream at the local, uh, you know, local cafe. Uh, and the uh, officers who came to investigate spoke to the father, they spoke Spanish. You know, this is a Spanish country. This is New Mexico, okay? And they, of course, they are going to speak Spanish. And the officers were themselves, you know, of, of Spanish culture. So that was the easiest way to communicate. So when people make movies about this, they miss all of that. Um, the, the bomb that had been exploded at ground zero was a test. So if you read a book about it, you will, they will talk about Oppenheimer, they will talk about Enrico Fermi, and they will talk about the test that they did to prove um, you know, that the plutonium bomb um, uh, could be uh, designed and exploded and it would be. Well, what kind of a test was it? Well, the bomb that was exploded at ground zero in New Mexico was essentially the same power as the bomb that destroyed Nagasaki, the Nagasaki Navy base in Japan. This was not a test. I mean, when, when you do a test in science, I was taught you, you take a small amount of something, you put it in a glassware and you mix it with acid and you do something and you see if a reaction works. And then if a reaction works, then you, you, you publish your findings and you get a patent. And then maybe, uh, you know, some big industrial company is going to buy your patent and, and they'll turn it into an industrial process. And that takes 10 years. Well, this was a full scale nuclear bomb. And um, it had the same effect as a full scale nuclear bomb, except that it didn't burn completely. So it showered the landscape over an area that covered about 70,000 people who had not been told about this. 
because it, this had to be secret, of course. And for good reasons, uh, you can argue now whether they should have found some excuse for evacuating the people, but they didn't. And it rained, you know, radioactive particles for days mixed with wind and rain and everything else over the whole thing, filling cisterns that people were using for drinking water, um, polluting the environment for cows who started dying or developing strange. Um, women started having problems with childbirth uh, and nobody said anything. And it took 10 or 15 years for the military to realize what had gone on there and then to start taking precautions. They did to their credit, they never blew up another atom bomb there. They moved to Nevada, to the Nevada test site where they could do essentially anything they wanted. But all that I discovered, you know, I didn't know the history of the war in Japan. It's extraordinary. And um, the way Japan capitulated, uh, the, what, that, what the atom bombs meant to the culture of Japan and meant to the American culture and meant to American science. So all of that we put in the book. So the, the, the book is not just about some flying saucer because there is no flying saucer there. The, the, the term flying saucer hadn't even been invented. And to me, this was an extraordinarily rich um, experience. And uh, I've gone back to the field four or five times with Paola, meeting the Padilla family. Uh, Paola found the third witness, Sabrina, who came in later and, and could tie everything together because she came in and was a witness to the, the, the things that the family was doing afterwards with some of the medals, some of the samples that were found in the landscape that the army hadn't collected. So the, the whole thing is extraordinarily rich. And I, I'm very grateful to have been involved in it because I've, it was from a pure scientific point of view uh, and from a historical point of view, it put so many things in perspective for me. Watch more podcast clips now on our YouTube channel. Go to Livewire Podcast Clips and watch more great podcast videos just like this one.